matter which one of my side. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. You guys morning. can all start finding your seats. For a few so, um, this week it was pretty cold out, but next week should be nice and warm uh, in comparison. So, praise the Lord. I'm not a cold person. Uh, I've been inside all week. I don't like being inside. <laughs> So if we could all bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for letting us gather here and worship you, Lord. Let us praise you in our hearts and our soul, Lord. I'd be just, just, just the two of us, for each of us, Lord. Let each person find you in their soul. Lord, let us remember that this is about you.
Psalm 108, David wrote this. He said, My heart is steadfast, O God. I will sing and make music with all my soul. Awake, harp and lyre, L-Y, I-R-E, not L-I-A. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the people. For great is your love. Higher than the heavens, your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Verse 5 says this, Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, and let your glory be over all.
Jesus is better, so make my heart with me. In every victory, in every victory, oh, Jesus is better, make my heart with me. extra and bring them in please and then we have uh, Valentine's Day is coming up uh, next week and uh, so ladies uh, have organized Tracy Angie and Nina as far as uh, parents night out so an opportunity to be able to uh, have some rock-solid uh, child care service and uh, they'll get fed um, it's going to be held uh, here on Saturday, February 11th from 5 to 8 p.m. 
So if you're interested in taking advantage of that, uh, get a hold of one of those three ladies. And, uh, and so we thank them in advance and along with their deputized uh, helpers, young adults, whatever. Um, so uh, thank you. Thank you, ladies, for giving that, uh, that opportunity. So again, with Hebrews, this is a letter to be read. Um, to the church, um, Jewish converts or, or Jewish people that uh, um, embraced uh, Christianity and uh, kind of like, uh, you know, it, it's kind of tough just starting um, where we are starting. So I like to take 30 seconds to just kind of back up. It's almost like double dutch, you know, the... The ropes are going, and you, you want to get your rhythm right before you jump right in. Um, so, in verse two or chapter two, uh, we're warned as far as uh, pay closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away. So, the teaching that's gone on here, and keep in mind these these aren't uh, um, brand new converts because later on in this uh, in this letter. They're told, hey, you should be teaching by now. Um, and here you are just on um, milk rather than the meat of God's word. And so there's a warning as far as pay close attention to what you, we've told you, what we've heard and we've shared with you and what, what you've, uh, unless you drift away from it. In chapter 3, um, verses 7, or uh, I'm going to, in 12, verse 12, take care, brethren, lest there should be any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart and falling away from the living God. And so, again, it's take care. There's a, he, they're recognizing there's drifting away and now there's beginning to doubt. Ver, or chapter 5, verses 11 here. Concerning him, we have much to say. And it's hard to explain since you become dull of hearing. So the drifting, the doubting, now becoming dull of heart, unbelieving. Uh, chapter 6, last week we heard as far as becoming sluggish or lazy. Um, verse 11 and 12. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end that you may not be sluggish but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises so he's telling them be zealous again you know what capture or worth the love and and the passion as far as what you've been taught what you've received so starting in verse 13, 613. For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply you. And thus, having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. Again, kind of going cold, it seems like well, it's disjointed from the conversation as it's going, but he's giving an example. He's telling them, you know, you pay attention to what we are telling you. And here's an Old Testament example of someone who didn't become lazy, didn't become sluggish, held on to the promises. And Abraham is the one that he points to. So this promise here that... Uh, Verse 14 shares, I will surely bless you, I will surely multiply you from God to Abraham. That wasn't the first time. We, we've been through Genesis. We recognize. I went back and counted. This is the sixth time that God spoke to Abraham as far as making a promise. Um, in chapter 12 of Genesis, that was the initial one where he says, leave your family Head out, and I will show you a land that I will give you. In chapter 13, it's where Abram and Lot split. Okay, Again, God spoke to him after that had happened as far as 
go out and look at the, the stars. And, and if you can count the stars, that's how many that your, uh, your family will grow, your descendants will be. In chapter 15 is uh, where uh, God told them to gather these animals together and they did the Old Testament version of, of an agreement and a covenant where they split the animals in half and then God had a sleep fall upon Abram and, and God had the smoking pot go in between the two uh, the, the halves of the animals and he declared his covenant with Abram. Chapter 17, that's where Ishmael is born. Whoops, you know, they got impatient and thinking, well, we need to help out. Maybe this is what God intended. And so we have Ishmael added to um, the mix here. And God spoke about circumcision with Abram. Chapter 18 is the three men that show up that um, Abram sees. And he begs them to come in, shows them hospitality, feeds them. And uh, at that time, one of them, you know, to, he realizes that they're angels after the fact, says next year that this time that uh, Sarai will have a child. And so from Genesis 12 to Genesis 18, there's been 24 years has gone on. Started out when he was 75 and he left his home country with Lot and his father. And now he's 99 at the time where the three men and the one says uh, next year at this time. Okay, we come to the one that's mentioned here in verse 14, the promise that God made. And that was at the time after um, Abraham was told to sacrifice Isaac, that he stopped him before it actually happened. And this, so it's in Genesis 22, 16 through 18. I'm going to read it. It's a little different than the other times. Okay, chapter 22, starting verse 16. And this is the Lord talking. It said, by myself, I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing, and you have not withheld your son, your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you, and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. This, to this promise, he swears by myself, I have sworn, declares the Lord. And so the writer of Hebrews picks up on this. Back to Hebrews. Verse 13 again, for when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. Now, you probably when you were a kid, uh, you know, you, you, you had friends that were maybe uh, not so reliable or proved themselves not to be so reliable, and they tell you something, and you're like, no, I, are you sure? And what's something that Scouts honor, scouts honor, that's the truth. You know, they, because they need something greater than themselves to say that this is true, because maybe they haven't been so truthful, they're calling on somebody else. You know, maybe, you know, maybe you've seen in, in movies where I swear on my mother's grave, you know, again, it's something beyond themselves. And so, but there is nothing greater than God. God didn't have anybody greater to say that based on this, this will come true. God is the greatest. God is awesome. And so he swore based on himself that promise. He 
he didn't need to swear. He did it for Abraham's sake that this would come true, to provide that additional insurance to, to continue to hold on to it. And he does it for our sake, too, that, that happened. This wasn't just... It was what happened in the life of Abraham and what and promises that God made to him, but this is done for our benefit. It's an example right here that they're trying to encourage a small church, and it should still be encouraging us today that it goes on. Um, Abraham patiently waited and obtained the promise. And that's an example for the church. A call to faith to enable them to be steadfast through the persecution, whatever it is that uh, they're struggling with that's calling them back. All right. Verse 16, For men swear by one greater than themselves, and with them an oath given as confirmation and end of every dispute. Again, sweary beyond them to be able to end the argument and say this is true what I'm saying. Verse 17, in the same way, God desiring even more to show the heirs of the promise, the unchangeableness of his purpose interposed with an oath, in order that by two unchangeable things, what are the two unchangeable things? His purpose, another word for that would be will or his counsel, and his oath that he swore by, unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we may have strong encouragement. It's given for their benefit. We who have fled for refuge and laying hold of the hope set before us. Verse 19. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast. Now, this hope that it keeps coming up isn't uh, uh, a positive attitude. I'm, you know, I'm hopeful that, you know, the temperatures can go up and, the, you know, things are going to get nicer. Or I'm hopeful to get a tax rebate or, you know, whatever. Having this positive attitude, I'm hopeful to get over, you know, the flu here so I can get back to work. I'm so tired of, you know of having to uh, be holed up at home. You know, I want to get out there. This is a hope. It's, it's a faith and salvation that Christ has provided for us. And so it's holding on to this hope. And, and so having fled for refuge and laying hold of the hope set before us. And it talks about that hope we have as an anchor. Barb and I like to... Uh, go fishing and we go on the Lemonware River and you know it's it's really not a strong current but if you're sitting there in the boat and we're fishing and I find a honey hole where I'm catching some fish I don't like it when the boat keeps moving you know away from that and especially if you know she ends up getting my spot there and so suddenly she's she's slaying the fish you need an anchor. And sometimes you need two anchors, you know, to keep you from spinning around and holding, holding you in place. And and that's what they're saying here, as far as the hope is, a, is an anchor. We don't need two anchors. Jesus is our anchor. Continue on through verse 19. And one which enters within the veil, where Jesus is entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. The veil, you know, the temple veil, it's, it must have been an incredible thing, and I don't know how they could have possibly woven it together, but it's said to be as, as thick, the cloth was as thick as a, a hand's breadth, and that it was incredibly heavy, and it, it protected the holy of holies from, you know, being seen by the people that would come into the temple. So they would have the table with the showbread and they would have a candelabra there, you know, there out in front of the veil, but only once a year back behind the veil was the Ark of the Covenant. And once a year, the high priest would go back there after 
he had a sacrifice for the own, his own sins that he's committed and then sacrifice for the nation Israel. And then he would go back in there and he'd splash blood on the Ark of the Covenant. But they would even tie a rope to the high priest so in case he died back there, they'd be able to pull him out because nobody could go in back behind that veil of the Holy of Holies except for that high priest. And we know, you know, according to the gospel here, that that veil was torn from the top down. Now, this was a huge, tall veil, uh, veil that separated and heavy cloth, and it was torn from the top to the bottom. And it says here where Jesus has entered within the veil, he's opened it, he's made it available for us to have access to God and him being a forerunner. And a forerunner, you know, the, the spies would be a good example of forerunners. They, they sent them out ahead of the group to, to be able to explore, to be able to set things up. And Jesus even declares in John 14, 2 through 4, again, I won't read the whole thing, but in, in my Father's house there are many rooms. And he talks about going ahead to prepare the rooms. And he says, you know, it's as I say it. And I'm going to come back and receive you when I've done it. It talks about Jesus being the forerunner, having going ahead and becoming a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. All right. We got seven verses there. Chapter seven. We're going to, um, before we get into that, again, a reminder what's the overarching theme that we have for Hebrews? Jesus is better. So now there's been little bits and pieces about talking about the high priest, talking about Melchizedek. And as we read this chapter 7, there's going to be some, it's steeped in Jewish culture, something that's probably not so familiar to us. Um, that would be just natural, separate, second nature to the people that he spoke to. One is going to be names and the meanings of names. And we've already been exposed to that. You know, examples, Isaac meaning laughter and Esau meaning hairy or, or red. Um, we even have names that end up being changed because there's a... A, a defining moment, a change in that life, and and Jacob to Israel, right? So Jacob from heel grabber to Israel, and uh, Abram and Sarah to Abraham and Sarah. Again, the names had meanings, and so we're going to be exposed to um, that genealogy. Oh, my favorite! That's going to be part of this too, and it's part of the Jewish culture. A third one is ancestors' actions and what happens because of that. So those are just three things. The Jewish nation, they were accustomed to having a high priest. And uh, that's something that is semi-foreign to us. Um, you know, maybe those with uh, uh, a Roman Catholic background, you know, have a have this idea of there is a, a man who's um, the intercessor, you know, that we go to when we have, confess our sins. We're going to this man and, and, he, and we're confessing our sins there and he's acting as the inner, you know, step between us and God and, and saying, okay, well, say, you know, so many of our fathers, so many... Hail Mary, so many, you know, and, and that kind of thing. And so uh, maybe it's not totally foreign, but it's a big deal for this, the Jewish people that there was somebody. The temple was set up, the, the, their portable tent, you know, temple, or the tabernacle that they took while they were out in the desert. And then again, Solomon's temple and Herod's temple, there was this need to have an individual that God had set up through the law as far as to be the go-between, between 
the people and God. The people, remember on, um, when Moses went up for the law, they say, oh, that, that we can't, we don't want to hear. It's too terrible to, to hear what God said. You go up, Moses, and you, and he'll tell you what to do, and you come down and won't do it. So it's, it's always been that culture as far as there's somebody standing in between them and God. All right. And Aaron was the first high priest appointed by God. And he set up the tribe of Levi. As far as that's where the high priest, that's where um, the workers of the uh, temple would come from. Specific tribe. Okay. So first, our chapter 7, verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of uh, Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him. I'm going to turn back there. Again, uh, it was something we covered. Uh, so, Genesis 14, verse 17, starting there. Then after his return from the defeat of Cherulamur and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him. So, the king of Sodom is going out to meet Abram after... Abram organized his 318 men to chase after the five kings that had conquered Sodom and Gomorrah. And actually they had conquered several other um, cities before they had come there. And so they grabbed people, they grabbed the riches, and they took off. So Abraham got word of it. He organized his own little party. He went out. They attacked by night. God granted them victory. He broke the, the kings fled, the armies fled. He had all the people. He had all the riches from what was gathered from that whole conquest that those kings had made. And he's coming back. So now the king of uh, Sodom is coming out to meet Abram. And all of a sudden, right here, verse 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now, he was a priest of God, Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God, Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God, Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave, Abram gave a tenth of all to Melchizedek. So that's the whole part that is referenced here. So verse 2, to whom also Abram apportioned tenth of all spoils was first of all, by the translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, which is king of peace. So Melchizedek's name means king of righteous, righteousness, and he also was a king of Salem, and Salem means peace, and he was also um, a priest of most high God, right there. So, Old Testament, there was a definite separation between king, the throne, and the temple, high priest. And Uzziah is a beautiful example of one king who stepped over that boundary. He, he was very proud, and he went into the temple, and he was looking to burn incense, and the priests were trying to stop him, and Uzziah continued on anyway, and God sentenced him. They struck him with leprosy, and he had leprosy for the remainder of his life. He was, you know, removed from the temple. He had to, and he was removed from his, you know, he had to live separate from the people for the remainder of his life. There was no mixing of those two positions. Yet here, Melchizedek is declared both king and high priest. And it's legitimate. He's a priest of the Most High God. There, there's very wise people going through Scripture that, that looks at Melchizedek. He's mentioned there in Genesis, which is 400 years, safe to say, before the Law of Moses um, that happened. Um, 
they were in bondage in, in Egypt for at least that amount, so that's a good round number. Okay, until Psalm 110 that we keep, that's referred to here, again brings up Melchizedek. And uh, there's scholars that say that Melchizedek was an Old Testament appearance of Christ. And uh, there's others that say, no, that's not the case. Really, for what we're sharing here, what you choose to, to believe there isn't going to change you know, what's, what's being said in the main point here. Um, and really, it can be one of those things that you get, you get caught up and you start taking your eye off what the main purpose is, trying to research or verify something that uh, you will know one day in, in the presence of Christ, uh, be able to have that answer. Um, as far as the record is, um, verse 3, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, he abides a priest perpetually. Holy Spirit, yeah, it's, isn't it wonderful as far as uh, what we've been studying is just all kind of lays into what you continue to study as you work your way through uh, God's Word. But it, it is just the way Melchizedek comes in and how heavily entrenched the Jewish tradition is on genealogy. That he begot him. He begot him. He begot him. And, and it goes on. But there is no mention as far as who the, the parents, the mother, the father of Melchizedek is. There is no mention of him dying either. And so the Holy Spirit takes and moves the writer of Hebrews into saying, look, this is a picture of Christ. As far as without father, without mother, without genealogy, having no beginning, no end, a high priest of God's calling. Verse 4, now observe how great this man was to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of choicest spoils. And those indeed of the sons of Levi who received the priest's office have commandment in the law to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their brethren, although these are descended from Abraham. But the one whose genealogy is not traced from them collected a tenth from Abraham and bless the one who had the promises. Talk about here as far as tithing was a sign of recognition, subjection, that this person was superior. Okay, so Abraham realizes the superiority of Melchizedek and provides him a tenth of the loot that's gathered from um, the defeat of the kings and, and the returning of Lot and the people. Um, and so it, it's, it's also super clever on, on as far as talking about, okay, we're, we're going to contrast that to the, the Levites, okay? You can say, well, Abraham, you know, gave a tenth to Melchizedek. Well, we give a tithe to the, to the Levites and uh, to the priests, to um, the workers of the temple. That was a law that was set up, that was ordained by God. It wasn't a recognition that it was the individual, the group was any superior to the other tribes. But this, in this case with Abraham and Melchizedek, there is a recognition. And there's the giving of the gift. All right. Verse 7. But without any dispute, the lesser is blessed by the greater. 
And again, this would be something that the Jewish people would recognize and say, yeah, that is the case. That the lesser is blessed by the greater. It doesn't go the other way around. And so the writer points out it was Melchizedek blessing Abraham. And Abraham is viewed as the father of the nation. Very great, faithful in, in, uh, in the pro receiving the promises of God, being faithful in um, the call to sacrifice his one and only son, that he was willing to do that. And yet Melchizedek is the one blessing Abraham. Verse 8, and in this case, mortal men receive tithes, but in that case, one receives them of whom it is witness that he lives on. And so to speak, through Abraham, even Levi, who received tithes, paid tithes, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Again, this is kind of brilliant in the fact that he talks about Melchizedek receiving the tithes, the recognition, and Levites receiving it because of the law that God ordained. But he says, look, Levi was in the loins of Abraham. So by Abraham giving the tithes to Melchizedek, technically the Levites also were involved in the giving of the tithes to Melchizedek. So there was a recognition that he was greater than the Levitical priest system that was set up. Verse 11. Now if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it people received the law, what further need was there for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be designated according to the order of Aaron? Again, that's like he's he's thinking what's going through the mind as far as what right does um, Melchizedek have to being a high priest when God has set up the law and ordained the tribes that the high priests are to come from. So there was a need for a change. God has called for it. He swore to it that Melchizedek that the Messiah was going to be the high priest by the order of Melchizedek. And uh, so law and tradition set up opposed to the order, the, the swearing, the choosing of the individual for the uh, role of high priest. Verse 12. For when the priesthood is changed of necessity, there takes place a change of law also. For the one concerning whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no one is officiated at the altar. 14. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, a tribe with reference to which Moses spoke nothing concerning priests. So the Jewish person would say, aha, see, Jesus was not from the tribe that was set up to be high priest. And so the writer of Hebrews says here that uh, there's a change going on here and it's sworn by God. And so obviously there needs to be a change in the law also. Verse 15, and this is clearer still, if another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become such, not on the basis of a law, a physical requirement, but according to the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, thou art a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So the point is, Jesus' priesthood, like Melchizedek, was based solely on the will of God, the calling of God, not heredity. God did not swear to Aaron or any other high priest that their priesthood would be forever, but God did swear to his son that he would be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Verse 18 
For on the one hand, there is a setting aside of a formal com a former commandment because of its weakness and uselessness. For the law made nothing perfect. The law given um, to the nation was a schoolmaster. It's described as that. It was it was a way for them to come to the point of realization of just how sinful we were, how um, we were in need of something more that we couldn't save ourselves. Now, during the Old Testament time, the law was viewed out of context of what it was originally given. It was taken as a bodily type thing as far as do not commit murder. Well, I didn't commit murder. It wasn't until Christ came and spoke about it and revealed, look, this is a spiritual matter. For you to even say, call your brother a fool, you are committing a sin against. You are, um, to look upon a woman with lust, you're committing a sin. It's not... The, the bodily thing, it's not what the Pharisees were doing. He said, you're, you're, you're choking on a camel trying to strain out a gnat. Again, they were had this outwardly appearance as far as, you know, a, a veil in front of them. So they don't dare breathe in a gnat or they're trying to gag because why the gnat hadn't been properly bled, so how could they consume it? They'd be, you know, violating the law. They were getting so lost in the weeds as far as man's trying to make it man's ability and man's strength to be able to accomplish the laws and self-righteousness. And that wasn't the case. And that's what the law has never provided salvation. It's a matter of showing the need for a savior. 18, so on one hand, there's a setting aside of the former commandments because of weakness and uselessness. 19, and on the other hand, there is a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God and inasmuch as it was not without an oath. For they indeed became priests without an oath. So that's the Old Testament, the line of Levi. But he, with an oath, through the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. Thou art a priest forever. Don't you love how he's built in this case? And I would love to have Holy Spirit as my, my lawyer, you know, as far as just setting the groundwork here and, and bringing it as far as the swearing of the oath and, and showing the failing of the past system and it's not it's not accomplishing what it is that man that the tribe of Israel thought it was accomplishing. In verse 22, so much more also Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. 23, and the former priests on one hand existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. They died. High priests came into the position. They, they were men. They died. A new high priest came in and, and, and took his place. Verse 24, but he, Jesus, on the other hand, because he abides forever, holds his priesthood permanently. So he's a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Verse 25, hence also he is able to save forever or uttermost, maybe in translation, those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for Christ is living forever. The high priest who, who, who never dies, who never. You know, the, talked earlier in there about as far as running to a refuge. You know, in the high, during the time of the high priest, they set up um, refuge cities. And in case of, you know, the, a man, you know, unintentional manslaughter, there would be 
a place for the individual to be able to run. So maybe they're chopping wood with somebody and swing back and the axe head you know, falls off the, the handle and strikes a, a person and, and kills them. Usually it was an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth was a mentality and there would be somebody from the deceased man's family who would be looking to take the life and they would have refuge cities that they'd be able to run to and the elders would take and hear the case and be able to judge and as long as the individual stayed in, within that refuge city during the life of the high priest he was he couldn't be touched by those that were seeking um, retaliation for what happened our high priest never dies he lives forever he is our refuge the, the gospel is our refuge the gift of salvation is our refuge he is our anchor. 26. For it, is, it was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the sins of the, the people. So again, the high priests during the Old Testament times, they were men and sinful men and they had to take care of their own before they could go and stand and represent the people to God. And, and the sacrifices that took place weren't a removal of sin. It was just a covering, a temporary covering of sin. And every time sin occurred, there would need to be, again, another covering that happens. But with Jesus as our high priest, that's not the case. He did not need to have, offer up the daily sacrifice for himself because this. He did once for all when he offered himself. It's beautiful. I mean, the, the talk about high priest here, and it's going to go on for a few more chapters. There's going to be different aspects here, but... I know in my own mind, thinking about the work that Christ did on the cross as the lamb being sacrificed. But there's a beautiful thing, a beautiful realization here. Not only was he the perfect lamb, the only one who was capable of being able to remove our sins um, through his sacrificial death, but he is the high priest who stands as our redeemer as our as protecting and saying no a, the, they are not guilty that I paid the price and it's taken care of he's the high priest he's torn, the veil is torn he's given us access there's no other high priest who has provided that direct access to God through Christ verse 28 for the law appoints men as high priests who are weak but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints a son made perfect forever For closing, I'd like to go back up to verse 25. So, hence also, he is able to save utter, uttermost or forever those who draw near to God through him. That word uttermost means not only forever, but it means completely. There's no partial, it is all done. And it's all done forever for all time. Secondly, it also points to that salvation is all about Christ's work. It's not ours. It says he is able, Jesus is able to save forever, uttermost, completely, for all times, those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make an intercession for them. No matter what we've done, how, how awful the sin, 
the work has been accomplished by Christ for us. Third part, Christ being able to uh, say to the uttermost is in the present tense. Now, the English language is not my strong suit, but what that does mean is it, it, it means that it's not just the initial thing, it is an ongoing thing. He saves, he continues to save, continues to save. So it wasn't just the Hebrew church here, but this is also written to us. And it's not just the initial gift of salvation, but a perpetual act of saving us. It's a beautiful thing. It's a glorious thing. And uh, the more you're into reading what God's word is, allowing his, his word to work on your heart, the more glorious it can be. It, it, it maybe knocks off some of the the callousness or the rust or the taken for granted that can happen, you know, by reading fresh and anew just how glorious the plan of salvation was. And that there's no happen chance to it. With Melchizedek, he comes in. And there's no listed genealogy, no beginning, no end, a picture of Christ, things to come. The law is given. Again, it's a picture of things that are to come, that God's work, it's a recognition of, of you know, what we should already know, but now we become aware of what it is. And, but the law is imperfect. It's a picture of what thing is to come. And it came with that with the birth of Christ, with his life, with his death, with his resurrection. And so, you know, may that inspire you. May it just bring you joy. May it loosen your tongue and allow you to be able to glorify him in, in song, in worship, in the workplace, in the family, within the body, as far as encouraging one another, as far as, you know, our God is sovereign. He's in control. Pick our head up and, 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 and you know, fix our mind on things above, not things below. And so uh, I'd like to encourage you with, that, with the truths shared today. Um, continue um, reading through and uh, may you be blessed by it and uh, may it prepare you for... Uh, you know, the words that are, are shared, how it's explained next week. Thank you. We'll close in prayer. Lord, we, we give you praise and thanks for doing the work that we can never do. Lord, we, we still try to. We still try to be good enough. Lord, to, may, we, may we search our hearts and, and and work out of love for you, not out of work for, for to try and gain anything. Lord, I know that there's rewards, and those rewards are are based on works that you you place before us, and we're faithful, Lord, in, in glorifying you and not ourselves. May we not be those whitewashed tombs filled with empty bones that we look good on the outside Lord and uh, choking on a camel straining out a gnat Lord our desire is to just fall humbly before you and proclaim your glory we love you our desire is to love you more and more Lord we, we pray for you know what our week is, what lies before us, so prepare us for us. Lord, uh, may we look to you and you alone and, and what's to be done and what's not to do, to be, to listen, to be still, to work, Lord. 
work out our salvation in a way that that honors you and causes others to be drawn to you for your glory alone.